Hi everybody, my name is Katie from Greenland Quilter and today we are going to talk to Danny about her YouTube channel. So I will turn it over first thing and let Danny tell you a little bit about herself and also what the name of her YouTube channel is. Hi, my name is Danny and my YouTube channel is called So Not an Expert and that is because I am not. <laughs> <laughs> like the rest of the people in my community, we are all learning to quilt, learning new techniques, learning new um, ways of doing things and things like that. I've been quilting for about four, maybe five years now, and I'm constantly learning new things. Um, I started my channel way back when, uh, almost two years ago now, just to meet new people and make new friends uh, like Katie. <laughs> When did you learn how to sew and did someone influence you to want to sew? Oh gosh. Um, when did I learn how to sew? Well, I, I, I think I've been behind or beside a sewing machine since I was probably six or seven years old. I, I don't think I was actually behind the needle of one until I was probably 10 or 11. I don't know the exact age. Um, my grandma was very short, very, very short. She was like four or nine if that. And so all of the clothes that she would buy, she had to hem everything, every pair of pants she bought, she'd have to hem. And so I was always sitting next to her when she was using that, uh, when she would hem her pants or she'd repair a button or she'd put buttons in or things like that. So I was always kind of around when she was using the machine and it always fascinated me. Um, it was just something that I always found fascinating. I, I just loved the, the sound of it. I loved how it worked. I loved how you could take all these pieces of scrap fabric and turn them into beautiful projects and things like that. And so when I got into grade school, uh, I think it was middle school is when they started offering like home economics classes where you could actually learn how to cook and sew and take care of a household and things like that. I don't even know if they offer those classes anymore, but that's where I first learned how to use the machine myself. I started learning all the parts of the machine. It was kind of, it was a more um, formal training on how to use a machine. And from there, it just kind of took off. I just, I've loved sewing in general. I do a lot of, I do machine sewing. I not huge on hand sewing, but I love cross stitching. I do some crocheting. I just, I've always loved that creative element to things. And, and I've always kind of tried to find ways to, to fill my downtime with projects like that. Um, my mom is a big crafter. She's always been a huge influence for me. Um, she's not necessarily a sewer so much as she's a crafter. Uh, she's, you know, making advent calendars and lamps and um, she's made um, placemat holders, uh, uh, coffee mugs, mug rugs, but not the like little plastic ones that you see right. with the yarn. I can't remember what the posters. Uh, oh, she's made yeah. a ton of those. She used to do craft shows when I was a kid. I remember, oh gosh, I remember being a little walking around those craft shows, just fascinated with the, the creativity of what other people could make and, and trying to figure out how to make those things myself. It was, it was always been a lot of fun. And when it came time to start sewing things myself, I started like most quilters, I started with garment sewing because that's what I knew. I didn't even know anything about quilting at the time. I just knew that you could make stuffed animals and you could make clothes. <laughs> Those were the only two things I really knew. And I, I enjoyed it, but I felt like my heart wasn't really in it. And, and I loved the sewing part of it. I loved sitting behind the machine and, and running it through the machine and doing that part of it. But the rest of it wasn't really my, it just really wasn't my cup of tea. And then somehow, I'm not even sure how it happened, but somehow I came across quilting. Um, and, and I thought to myself, you know, that's way more sewing than it is pinning and cutting, or so I thought anyway, at the time. Um, and I thought I could do that. I could, I could, that would put me behind the machine more. And so that's kind of how I started with my quilting journey. Um, do you know when you discovered you wanted to start making quilts? Um, you know, time frame was, wise? I'm sorry? Time frame wise? It was about five years ago, four or five years ago, I want to say. Um, I had just finished making Halloween costumes for my daughters. Uh, I have twin daughters. For those mm -hmm. of you who don't know, I have twin daughters. They're going to be 21 in March. Um, 
but I did, just finished making two ha account Halloween costumes for each of them, and I was looking for a project to do um, that would kind of use up some of the scrap fabrics that I had, and again, I, I just kind of wanted to find something that would sit me behind the machine more than it was pressing and pinning and, and cutting, and I just wanted to get away from all of that. So um, again, I'm not really even sure how I came across quilting, but Somehow I came across a Donna Jordan video of all the videos out there. That's the first video I came across. And it was for um, the Friendship Table Runner. It was the very first video I'd ever come across, YouTube video I came across for quilting. And I was watching her make it and I thought, I could do that. That's easy enough. That's just straight stitch sewing. There's nothing to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so then I started watching some more videos and trying to get more ideas. And then I... I decided to bite the bullet one day and I went on to um, uh, Donna Jordan's website and I bought some pre-cut fabrics. I think I bought a jelly roll, a couple of jelly rolls and a couple of yardages of fabric and got them sent home and just sat down in front of the, the machine and, and tried to duplicate what she did. It was, it was a learning curve for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted it to. Uh, not, your first project never does. Uh, but after that, it was like, okay, I, I really like this. I really enjoy doing this. And so I just kind of kept kept going from there. On your first quilt, do you still also have that quilt? Not the PMQ, but a, a, your very first ever quilt you made. Do the you very first that? quilt I made, no, I do not. I actually gifted that one away. Um, I and I don't even have the friendship um, table runners anymore either. I've gifted those as well as well. Um, the first quilt I made, I went big or went home. I went from a table runner to a king size Bargello. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went. Wow. I really did not think that that was going to be as hard <laughs> as it turned out to be. It was very very challenging. Um, and actually the. The Bargello quilt is my logo. Um, if, if you check out my channel, you'll see the rainbow Bargello is my logo. Um, and that is that is the quilt that I am the most proud of because it was a labor of love. It was the first quilt that I actually, the quilt like blanket that I actually did. Um, and it was, it was a labor of love for sure. <laughs> Do you think your quilting has evolved since then? Oh gosh, yes, for sure. I mean, even just my sewing skills, I think, have evolved since then. Um, I, I've learned so much about um, seams. I've learned so much about different stitch types. I've learned so much about using the machine. I've upgraded my machine three times since um, I started. In fact, I just gave my very first machine, I just gave that one away to a friend of mine to start to start learning how to do her own. So that's been a lot of fun, but oh yeah, evolved for sure. Yeah, I, I am amazed by the difference in quality <laughs> from my first projects to now. It's it's night and day. So do you like to make quilts that are traditional or modern or do you kind of lean in between? Um, I mean, I guess it really depends on your definition of those two, but I would probably have to say more modern. I am a bright colored kind of person, uh, bright colors, bright textures, things like that. So I, I would have to say I'm more of a modern. I'm not big into the more the Civil War prints and the more yeah. subdued prints like that. I, I'm, I'm much bigger and brighter and bolder. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of like that is evident by the lime green sewing room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what are your favorite fabric styles and designers of fabric? Styles? You know what I love? I love grunge. The grunge fabric line by Moda is probably my number one favorite fabric to go with. Um, I just, I love the, 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 the difference of colors that kind of pull in and batiks are also one of my favorites for the same reason. They have these, these multitude of different colors that kind of get pulled in and they're not really any specific print. I mean, some, sometimes they are, but for the most part, there's this, this, I don't want to say tie dye cause it's really not, but there's these 
different colors that kind of come in that are just my absolute favorite. It, it, my go-to for, especially for backing or binding fabric is grunge. I, I go to grunge as much as I can. Um, I love the texture of Moda fabrics. It's just nice and soft and it's easy to work with. Um, and then I also just love the print colors and the range of colors to choose from. I remember, I don't know if it was for, uh, I think it might've been grammar school because I don't remember doing it in high school. But um, we were in an art class where we had fabric and wax and dye. Mm. And we hand dyed a piece of fabric using wax in different colors. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. That and, is back then, cool. I didn't know it was called the geeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at that. You knew, you had a skill you didn't even know you knew. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. And I, I also, I think one of those grades we did tie dyeing. And I, I wasn't so fascinated with twisting a shirt up and doing that with it. I liked the aspect of the wax and the, dropping the color and covering that color up and dye it, then put more on there and, dye, you know, keep on going with it. And I oh, thought I that was very interesting. I would love to go to Indonesia just to sit in awe and watch them do that process because I think it would be very cool. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that would be, that would probably be one of my favorites. But yeah, batiks are probably one of my favorites. They're definitely my go-to. Um, I, 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 have a tendency to lean when I'm doing a project for myself or I'm doing a project um, um, for that I, I have a tendency to lean towards those types of fabrics where it's not really a print it's more of just a it's your ability to take color and use it how you want to mm -hmm. that's how I see it because um, you probably notice I have petite over here on two walls <laughs> I see that but I have seven quilt tops right now that are all petites wow and wow. um, I'm working on a stash. And when I get the stash to the to the limit I want it at, I want to make a quilt top that has 100 colors in it. That, that is would be really cool. Future goal, have 100 petite colors in there. Wow. And I think that it would, would be, be fun to do that with it, you know, just go with the flow with it. Mm -hmm. um, besides the petites and the grunge, is there any other one that you can like a lot that you use or no? Um, not really. I mean, I don't really have a go to. I mean, obviously, I think I like any high quality fabric. I have been really into the Michael Miller's fabrics recently because yeah. of cotton cuts. It appears that the last two cotton cuts projects that I worked on were both Michael Mills, Michael Miller fabrics. So it was like coincidence that I, I don't usually look at the names of the fabrics. I just look at the color palette and both mm -hmm. of those were. So I have to say Michael Miller has probably grown on me a little bit. Uh, Timeless Treasures is another one that I really enjoy because I love the bright, bold colors that they offer. Um, I, I actually have just purchased a bundle, a pre-cut bundle from them uh, that I'm looking forward to start working on next year because I'm done with this year. My I'm booked up with projects yeah, I I this year. <laughs> I uh I also think that Jason Yenther is another good person for colorful things like that, you know, because I've kind of grown to love that fabric line, even though I don't buy much of it. It's usually because it comes on a PMQ or something, and yeah. I'm like, oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm still learning a lot of the different brands and the different designers. Um, I kind of just go with whatever I think looks yeah. nice. I don't necessarily look to see who's creating it. I know the Moda, the Grunge by Moda, because that is one of my go-tos. Yep. I know right where that's at in my quilt store. <laughs> but everything else, I just kind of go with the look and feel of it. Um, you know, I, I just kind of, I have an idea or usually I have a pattern in mind of what I want to work with. Or I see an advertisement for it. I mean, we all get those silly emails from yeah. you start quilt company <laughs> or jordan fabrics and you go oh that's pretty i'll take that i have no idea who makes it i have no idea what it feels like but it looks pretty i'll take it <laughs> yeah yeah um I, it took me a long time to even recognize certain lines and then there's still certain lines i couldn't tell you that from adam's house cat but and but yeah i agree with you on that how long wait that's not what's there do you have any favorite quilt pattern designer no, no, I, I really either. don't. I mean, I, I really, I don't, I don't feel like I've made enough quilts to be able to pick a specific designer. 
Um, I know that Cozy Quilt Designs makes some really nice stuff. I've made a couple of their things. I've done some, uh, I've done a bunch of Donna Jordan's free patterns because they're free. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a bunch of those. I, I really don't have a go-to for patterns. Again, it's kind of like with the fabric. It's whatever I'm kind of feeling in that moment, whatever kind of speaks to me, that's kind of what I go with. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I really have a favorite pattern designer either. I mean, they're, I tend to, I don't know if you do this or not, but sometimes I'll take a pattern where there's blocks and it has negative space and I'll put something in the negative space. <laughs> I haven't gotten that far yet. No, I'm, I'm still, I'm still learning. I will find, I hate plain solid fabric, just like a solid black or solid white or solid cream. I just, that's why I go with the grunge because it's not a solid color. Yeah. It's got the variances of colors in it I, it's just not one of my favorite things i have recently made a couple of quilts with some solid black fabric in them in some blank spaces and it turned out beautiful don't get me wrong but i probably if i were to do it again i'd probably buy some type of tone on tone mm -hmm. black or something to kind of give it a little bit of a texture um solid is just not it's not my jam yeah <laughs> i haven't used much solid me. either so i agree with you on that one um when did you discover you wanted to become a quilt influencer by starting your own YouTube channel? And how has it changed over time? You know, that was kind of on a whim a little bit. Um, <laughs> the thing is, is, I mean, I, my local quilt store is about an hour from my house. It's not very close. Um, so I don't really have anywhere to kind of hang out with other people in the trade. Uh, there's right. not anywhere close that I can hang out with anybody in the trade. And so I've watched a handful of, I had watched a handful of YouTube influencers. So Becca was one of the big ones that I, I found. And the thing I loved about Becca is especially when she was, um, in her, at her previous home, I, the very first video I watched of her, she was having a bad day. We all have them. But she yep. was having a bad day and she was still on the camera. She 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 was on her camera. She was doing her live stream. She was having a bad day. She just, she couldn't focus on anything. She, she just kind of broke down and it was just, it was so raw and it was so real and it was so, it was so normal. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't staged. It wasn't Hollywoodized or anything like that. It was just, it was, she was just, it was just her. She was just, she was being herself on the camera in front of all of her friends um and and so when i wanted to make friends in this industry and learn from those friends because i really learned better with interaction from people yeah. um the, the best way that i knew to do that was through a youtube channel now i tried to do it through other channels um but i just didn't feel like i was really getting i wasn't getting out of it what i wanted or, or the goal yeah. that i was trying to set for myself it just wasn't there so i thought you know what why don't I try it? Why don't I turn my camera on, record a video and try it out? And I was, <laughs> my very first video was, was, I was so embarrassed to do it. I didn't even tell anyone that I recorded it. My my husband had went away. Uh, he would went out of the house for something. I don't even know where, why he was gone, but he was gone for the day. And I recorded it while he was gone because I didn't even want him to know I was recording it because I just felt so silly. Um, so I recorded the video. I did some really awful rough editing in like one of the free editing software programs that Microsoft has. And, and then I thought, you know what, screw it. And so I just, I created a channel and I, and I threw it up on YouTube and I thought there, I did it. I've done it. No one's ever going to see it, <laughs> but I'll put it up there anyway. And then I thought, well, that's kind of silly. Why did you spend all that time? If nobody's going to see it, you should at least get somebody to watch it and tell you if they're, they, you did okay or not. So I shared it with some friends and family and I, I just, I posted a message on my Facebook and I just said, I did a thing and I put a link to the video. <laughs> so that was all I did. Um, and it kind of developed from there. Um, I just remember after like 20 views on the first video, I was like, okay, I know 20 people. That's fine. But then when yeah. I got to 50 views, I'm like, wait a minute. I don't know 50 people. Who are all these people watching the video? <laughs> I know what you mean. You know, my channel blew up too, so... 
Right. And I'm like, I don't even know 50 people. How? Is... And so then I, you know, I'm like, well, I mean, I got to keep this going now, you know, I got to do another one. And so I did another one and then another one and then another one. And the first year that I had the channel, I did a video, at least one video a week. I was trying to do two videos a week, but it became a lot um, before I really discovered the live stream aspect of it. I was doing the videos and it was, I was just like fascinated with the fact that somebody would watch <laughs> like anyone, anyone would watch. And then with the live streams, when I, when the live stream button showed up on YouTube, I was like, Ooh, what's this? And I, clicked, <laughs> I clicked the button and the camera turns. On. I'm like, Ooh, I'm live. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, I guess we're going to sew today. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> So my very first live stream, I was like, I guess this is what we're doing today. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of fun. But yeah, has it evolved over time? Absolutely. 100 um, percent It's not nearly as perfect as some other streams out there for sure. But I I don't I think you have to... I don't think you need to look for perfection. What you need to what all of us need to do is just get it out there and share what we know and what we love. It doesn't have to be perfect because then it turns into something fake. Well, and I mean, and that's the premise behind my channel specifically. And the name of the channel is I am not an expert. Yeah. And I <laughs> pretend to be an expert. You know, my viewers, my subscribers, my community, they're the experts. And I'm learning from them um, more so than they're going to be learning anything from me. Um, but eventually I'd like to become an expert. I mean, that is the goal is eventually you, I'd like to be an expert. So you can still be an expert and still not preach perfection. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I think all newbies need to learn mm -hmm. when they're learning this industry is they do not have to make their quilt top perfect. That's no. not the goal of this. The, the goal is to learn and to be happy with what you make and be proud of what you make, even with all the little flaws in it. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's not one perfect human out there. Oh, absolutely. That no. is one of the things that I, I push all the time on my, my channel is done is better than perfect. And Lord knows right. my stuff is not perfect by any means. Um, you know, the, my subscribers, my, my channel, my community, they see me pulling out my seam ripper all the time and I'm constantly making mistakes with things. And I've been told <laughs> that when I make those types of mistakes, that I have a very positive attitude about it. And, yeah. and my response to that is simple. It's, what other attitude am I going to have? I mean, it, yeah. I'm learning, you know, it's, I've made a mistake. Okay. Now I, now I need to make a decision. Do I pull it apart and start over or do I just leave it? <laughs> that's one of the beautiful things about handmade projects is they're not going to be perfect. They're never going to be perfect. If they're perfect, then they're not handmade. That's um, right. You know, um, I'm angle challenge. You probably know what that means. And <laughs> I'll have made, I've made a quilt top where, I turned a half square triangle the wrong way mm -hmm. and not see it until the whole thing's done. And I'll show it on here and somebody say, hey, Katie, did you see that that side, blah, blah, blah. And when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, we actually have a, a, a project that we've been working on 11 weeks now, 11 11 episodes, not 11 weeks, 11 episodes. Uh, and it's usually about one episode a month for my channel with things. And we've been working on this project, tro our Tropics project for 11 episodes. Mm -hmm. And I have managed to put this thing together wrong four times. Four times. I <laughs> put it together. I've had to take the entire thing apart and put it back together four times. <laughs> yeah, I want you to see something here. You see it's this not pattern? It's a Lori Holt pattern. Uh-huh. Okay, but that outer, the purple ring down there, uh -huh. I, I, what I did is I was doing a swap and I put a love block in the middle of the circle, but oh, that's cute. the problem. It was the purple part you see on here. Yeah. Do you know how many times I had to rip that out and start again? <laughs> because I turned the triangles the wrong darn direction. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so and, and, to make, and to add injury to insult, I had my leaves upside down. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, been but there. My, but I fixed it. I didn't give up to, and start again. I actually fixed it and um, quilted it and sent it to my swap partner. 
And I got an email back. She's like, I don't know what you did, but that sure is beautiful. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> perseverance works. You don't have to make it perfect. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and you know, you just, you really have a decision to make. Like when I put the the quilt back, wrong, quilt together wrong, you know, my community is like, Danny, just leave it. Just leave it. It'll look fine. And I'm like, it probably would. You're right. But in this particular case, I was trying to make a secondary pattern with it. And without, and if I didn't put the blocks back the way they needed to go, then I wasn't going to get the secondary pattern. And I really like the secondary one more than I like the initial one. <laughs> so I'm like, no, it's kind of important to me that I put it together the right way. So I took an entire Sunday and pulled every single block back. Aww. Did you um see the recent Donna Jordan video about where she found a block that was turned the wrong way in a finished quilted block, uh, quilt and she showed you how to remove it, turn it around, fix it all, put it back in and then re-quilt that spot. I did not. I, you know, I did see, I saw the notification for it, but I haven't gotten a chance you to You need watch. to watch it. It's really cool what she did. I'm like, you can do that? I would have thought that you would never be able to just take something out that's already been so not once, but like twice, you know. Yeah, so I've heard that was a way to do it. Yeah, yeah, you know, technology and uh, well, I don't think it's so much about technology; it's about knowledge of how quilts go together. And once you figure out all of that, then you you're probably capable of doing almost anything. When you know, she's been doing this a long time, so thirty years down the road, you might be doing something similar. You know, you never know. Mm -hmm. Um. We, I asked you off camera about cotton cuts. How did you discover cotton cuts when you um did your first puzzle mystery quilt? Um, I think Becca introduced me to it. Okay, <laughs> I'm almost positive it was it was an episode that I watched of Becca, and it, I, the thing I loved the most about it was I was it was very new to quilting. I was still trying to learn the cutting techniques and things like that, and I was not great at it. And I loved the idea that it was already cut for you and all you had to do was sew it together. Um, so that was kind of where I started with that. And that's why I decided, you know what, I, I think I could do this. And so I signed up for it because everything was pre-cut. Yeah. They were gonna, all the pre-cut pieces, all you had to do was put it together. And at the end, you were going to come up with this beautiful quilt. And then the more I got into it, the more I really loved the mystery part of it too. You know, when you started to get these pieces that you started to put together and you're kind of like trying to figure out what this thing is going to look like and you just, you cannot figure it out to save your life. No. <laughs> it is all over the place. And I'm like, the more and more I did it, the more excited I got it. And, and I have a lot of videos on my channel of uh, the PMQs, my previous PMQs. And in the first couple of videos on my channel were the Olympia cult, which was the first one that I worked on. It was towards the end. I had, I had already done most of it by right. the time recording um but it was just so much fun I really loved it and I was really kind of bummed that I didn't get to join them this year um but I just I have I had way too many projects going and I had some financial stuff going on too though so I just I really couldn't fit it in the budget um but I'm, I'm pretty sure <laughs> I'll be in the next one which I think is probably like around November or December or something. yeah uh the signups begin on November Either it's the first Friday in November. Let me look at the calendar. Hang on a second. Because I know it was either November 3rd or November 4th. Let me look. And the only reason I know that is because I asked. <laughs> <laughs> but but she's, probably... already, she's already pre announced it uh, recently, anyway. Um, but you know, yeah. Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. uh, the third. All right. November 3rd. That's the. Uh, Sign up again. Um, you're gonna love probably the I I ha, I don't know what fabric's being used yet. Um, but I know what the theme is gonna be, and you're probably gonna like it. Well, I'm hopeful. Hey, I'm, hey. I'm really excited. I I loved those projects. I have three of them that I've done so far. I've done three full size quilts, and then I've done a couple of their like littler ones. Mm -hmm, the um, minis. Yeah, yeah, I've done a couple of their mini ones, and I just, I just love that they're the pieces are already cut up for you. It's just like one last thing. When I first first starting it, it was wonderful because it's like, oh, okay, this is what the pieces are supposed to look like. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Um. Now I, I think I have a little bit more of a, 
I think my skill level for cutting is a little bit better, still not great, but a little bit better that I probably could manage it now. But even still, I now it's more the mystery part of it that yeah. That really and I too. also think it builds skills too. I mean, you you talked about your skill set being better, and the better your skill set is, the better your PMQ is going to look. Yep. Yeah, I mean, but the wonderful thing about it, though, is even if you're a brand new quilter and you've never done mm -hmm. anything before, I've met quite a few, even in my community, that are brand new quilters that have never made a quilt before in their lives, and they joined the PMQ because because it was pre-cut, yep. the pieces are already there for you, it's so easy to sew together, they're straight lines, the most challenging part about the whole thing is they do use a lot of corners, um, but there are tricks of the trade that you can use to try and work through those. And I've worked through some of those on some of my videos as well. Um, you know, eventually you get to a point where you understand how they work. And after, you know, the second or third month of the PMQ, you start to figure out how those work. But that's yeah. the thing that I really love the most about it is it's so simple and so easy to do. And it's really, I mean, I say that it wasn't in my budget this year because I just had so many other things going on, but they're really for what you're getting, it's actually pretty inexpensive. It comes out to be about the same as a full size quilt kit would be if you were yeah, to buy it. Yeah, it does. It's about the same price right now currently. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so it's, uh, not, it's not like it's super expensive. It's just, it was just one of those things I just didn't have it in the budget this time. Yeah, I understand. Um, stay tuned to the Cotton Cuts website because, uh, uh, not website, the Facebook group because. I didn't know if you caught this on the carnival, but we all participated in voting on the names for each colorway. And Ooh. she's going to let us name them again for this next colorway. That's exciting. I did notice that, yeah. It was a big hit. And it's, uh, this is the first year or first time I've seen so many join and they're putting their pictures on the website or on wow. Facebook and on the website. And uh, we're getting more engagement. And I think that's fantastic, especially for that, all the new people. Yeah, I know that they've seen quite, Cotton Cuts itself has seen quite a bit of growth on the PMQ process. And yeah. that has a lot to do with the influencers as well. But um, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I'm a huge, I'm an avid supporter of the company. I try to, to try to participate however I can. I love their Rosa's Holiday Your Way boxes. Did I've you see the one? Not yet. I was going to talk to you. Better about hurry that. up, girlfriend, because I caught it before they posted it on Facebook. And no, I was, listen, they didn't tell me when it was going up. I, uh, two, three nights ago, I think, or four nights ago, I, I got to thinking, okay, I've already got my Missouri store paid for. I signed up for my first ad bit was Sugary Do. But where is Rosa? And I remember that Kim told us. Um, a week before that it was going to go live sometime this week and I'm thinking well today's Monday and I haven't heard anything so I went and looked and do you know what I found on there <laughs> the link to it yeah I got an email from from uh, Cotton Cuts the next Monday. day yeah I think it was Monday it was I, Tuesday, I think I think it was Tuesday when the email came up because it was Monday not well it was mo after Monday night or after midnight, which would have been Tuesday, when I stumbled onto it, my time. So it was still on Monday night in the U.S. Gotcha. when I stumbled onto it. And I, um, I'm like, ooh, what do we have here? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten, I've participated in that for a couple of years now. I've got a, a whole slew of of um, fat quarters from there. Um, I, I love the the fabrics and the prints that they come up with. And and I use the fat quarters as giveaways on my channel and I use them for miscellaneous projects. Um, yeah, yeah. Lot, um, so. Whatever colors that I don't care for and the batiks has been fantastic. But I did both cottons and batiks last year. But I, I've been saving back some of the uh, cottons like there was some tulip ink. I had, you know, well, I get tulip ink every now and then it shows up in one of the classic boxes too. And they've been collecting and been collecting and I have this many now, and I'm going to give them to Ian. Wow. Because Ian is a tulip ink freak. <laughs> and I and I know he's like you, he's on a budget. So, you know, donations are great. 
Yeah, exactly. And I don't mind sending it because it'll just sit here in that bag till, you know. Okay, and I got off tangent here. Uh, have you ever tried any of the other subscription programs to cut cuts? Um, from cotton cuts. No, I have not. Um, okay. I don't have a lot of storage space to be able to like build a stash like that. I mean, this is what you see here. This is all I got. <laughs> There's nothing left to the camera. This you have a very neat room. You should see mine right now. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. But this is only the side of the camera. <laughs> yeah, I, we, we've reset my um, sewing room. and We turned the big table around and everything. And so now it's like trying to get everything put away and out of yeah uh, well, it's actually one of my this is one of my daughters her bedroom when she moved away okay. to college i kind of took it over um my sewing is a my sewing machine here is actually inside of a cabinet it looks like an armoire when it's closed mm -hmm. um so that's where my sewing machine is usually housed when she's home and then this is actually her shelf that she was using when she was home she had clothes and stuff in it and i kind of took it over <laughs> that's great it looks like the little cabinets that i use uh in the living room mm -hmm. Um, do you have any future endeavors that you want to talk about? Future endeavors that I want to talk about. Um, I have some plans for some things that I'd like to, I've started recently, um, adopting a second day. Cause so I stopped doing videos on my channel. Um, it, it just, it, I was stressing myself out about it and I wasn't having any fun. And the thing that I've made a promise to my entire community is that as long as I'm having fun with it, I will keep doing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when I started to not have fun is when I started to like second guess what I was doing with my channel and what it was that wasn't fun. And, and to be perfectly honest, it was the recording and editing of videos. That was not the fun part. I love the live stream aspect of it. And so I've kept the live streams and got rid and gotten rid of the videos. I will do an occasional video every now and again, when I have something specific that I want to show people, but for the most part, it's live streams only. Um, but, and I was only doing one live stream a week. I was doing Sunday mornings at 10 30 AM central time. That's that's my time slot for my live streams. Um, but I found that, and I knew this going in, but the 10.30 a.m. slot on a Sunday morning is kind of a, a lot of people are unavailable at that particular time slot. And I'd like to try and make as many friends as I can. Not necessarily get more views on my channel. I'm more interested in making new friends. Yeah. Um, so I have added another set of videos to my channel i now have a saturday evening stream not every saturday um just kind of some spotty saturdays in in the mix here every month um, but i've added a second stream to the channel a second day of streams to the channel to try and allow for some of my other subscribers to be able to catch me on a live stream since they probably can't catch me on sunday mornings um and also you know to, to try and make some more new friends so uh the possible the next endeavor i want to see on the channel is i'd like to see more of that i'd like to do some more i'd like to incorporate more of those live streams um i'd like to start some collaborations with some other creators i've got a bunch of ideas of things that i want to do it's just a matter of trying to coordinate that stuff because i'm a weekend warrior i don't have a lot of time during the week between my full-time job and my family to try and do a lot of projects during the week. So I'm more of a weekend warrior. So I have to be able to accommodate that as well. Yeah. Um, but that's one thing I would like to try to, to squeeze in at some point would be learning how, you know, collaborating with some other creators and, and having some fun with some things like that. The collaboration is definitely interesting for me right now. <laughs> the technology is what's kind of taking me around a little bit, but I'm managing. Uh, I did a collab with uh, Martha tonight. Um, she did the uh, live this time. We're doing every other with the uh, mode of blockheads. But, um, and you and I have to talk about them. Yes, we do. Off camera. Yep, off camera. That's right. Um, I like to surprise my subscribers. I don't like to give a lot away. Now we have a secret and we're keeping it right now. <laughs> Where did I tell it? <laughs> You're not going to tell. Um, can you share five tips for someone who is new to making quilts that you think would help them become more comfortable while learning to make quilts? Oh, my. Five tips? Oh, five me. tips. Oh, put me on the spot here a little bit here. Um, well, we've all talked about being newbies, so 
what did we not know back then that we know now might help another person? Five tips. Um, the first one I would say, and, and this is probably, it's probably something that's common sense basically, but just relax, <laughs> just, just relax. You don't stress yourself out. Focus on the fact that you're there to have fun. Yes, you're also there to make a project of some kind or do some, make some task or something like that. But the, the goal of this is to have fun. That is the whole point of this. It is to relax and have fun. So mm -hmm. trying, and that would probably be my number one thing, would just, just have fun. And that's probably one of the things I try to incorporate the most on my channel is no matter what we're doing, we're having fun. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, that, that would probably be number one. Um, number two would be um, make sure that you have sharp tools. Um, always have a sharp needle, always have a sharp blade. Um, don't be afraid to change those blades and those needles more often than you think you need to. Um, because uh, you will find over time, you will learn that a sharper tool works better than a duller one. And they go dull a lot faster than you think they do. Mm -hmm. um, I have learned that lesson, especially with my rotary cutter. I really needed to start changing the blade out more often than I was. And I know the blades can be very expensive and they can be, they can just be very dangerous and things like that. So I understand why I wasn't changing it out as often as I needed to, but I have found that if I change it a little bit more often, I've made my life a little bit easier. Okay. <laughs> and I'm a little less frustrated. So that would probably be number two is make sure that you have sharp tools. And that includes your seam rippers as well. You know, there's a reason that every time you buy just about anything, they give you a free seam ripper. It's because you are probably going to use that tool more than anything else. And they go dull quickly. So don't be afraid. And I know everybody has their beautiful hand carved, handled seam ripper that they absolutely love. And then, and in those cases, set that one aside and use a cheapo yeah, one. Use the cheapo. <laughs> use the cheapo one because that's the one that you won't feel guilty about tossing because it starts to go dull. So, so that's what I would say for number two is make sure you have sharp tools. Um, number three would probably be don't stress about having all of the gizmos and gadgets that everyone has. There are basic tools that you, there are, there are only a handful of basic tools that you absolutely have to have in order to be quilting. You don't need all of the other gizmos and gadgets. Now, it's not to say that they don't make your life easier and they're fun to use, but you don't need them. You know, you need a basic cutter and you don't even have to have a rotary cutter it could just be a pair of scissors if you're really just starting out you need you know thread and needles you need a, a basic set of rulers so that you can measure things but you don't have to stress about getting all these gizmos and gadgets and, and whatchamacallits and different size um you know different size the rulers and the, you just don't need to stress about all that stuff start out with the the bare minimum and go from there and slowly build up your arsenal would mm. probably be my next one okay um, is that number four i lost count we're going on number four now oh, okay i lost that count was, oh was my gosh three. it's going to be five <laughs> <laughs> that was number three now we're going to number four i know oh my goodness um number four what would i say for number four? Oh, clean out your machine <laughs> Your machine is going to get dirty. <laughs> clean it. Uh, I clean mine every after every live stream because it literally will get gunky after every live stream. And depending on what types of fabrics you're you you're using, it will get more and more gunky depending on what you're doing. So the the best advice I can give you, the easiest way to maintain your machine is just to clean it. Uh, don't use one of those aerosol can things. Don't don't do that. You think do you that. could use those? No, they they actually say not to because it pushes the stuff back into the further into the machine as opposed to pulling it out. Uh, the you know best what I would like to see is somebody to come up with an itty bitty tiny hand vac that you can stick in there and suck it all out. Well, I have a keyboard vacuum that I use. Oh, look at you! I wish I could find me one because uh, <laughs> I have a Janome and I can get most of the stuff out, but there's these really tight places. And you can see there's all kinds of little 
mechanical things sitting in there and I'm reluctant to stick too much of anything down in there. You know what I have found that works the absolute best for my machine is a stiff bristled paintbrush. Really? Yes. Okay. I found I, I found a long handle and I wish I could find it because I have seemed to have misplaced it at the moment. Um, but it is a stiff bristle, long handled paintbrush. Uh, you can buy them at any no local quilt store. Just make sure it's a stiff bristle. So the, the one I have is like, it's almost like a straw bristle. It's very, very stiff. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not stiff enough that it's going to scratch anything, but it's stiff enough that it holds its shape when I kind of smush it in there. Yeah. Um, but I found that to be the best tool for cleaning. Now I have like your little singer, your little singer soft bristle, you know, and this is great for like just kind of dusting a little bit, but that soft, that stiff bristle paintbrush I have found the absolute best because it grabs onto the dust and pulls it back out for you yeah so that makes like, great sense <laughs> yeah okay. that's what I have found works the absolute best that and these little toothpick thingies with the little cotton yeah I have those they have the like mini q-tip on yeah. it or whatever that is yes you can buy those guys buy. hundreds from Amazon Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. You don't have to buy the cool name brand ones. You can no, buy the don't. inexpensive ones from Amazon and they look like toothpicks, but they got like a pointed end on them. They're almost, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, a Q-tip, but they got a pointed end on them. You can buy thousands of them for a couple of bucks. Those are probably work better than anything else you're going to find. But so number four would be clean your machine often. Now, usually, and I actually have a video on my channel that shows what I do, what my process is for when I start a new project. Um, but I will do that that particular process way more than just when I start a project. I do it right. throughout the project. Like I said, after every live stream, I will clean down my machine. I will tear the whole thing apart <laughs> and clean it and put it all back together so that I know it's ready. Now, I don't always change the needle out every time, but I do change the needle out probably every two to three streams. Um, and again, right now I'm really only sewing on my live streams. I don't sew a whole lot off of my live streams right now. I notice that sometimes when the needle is starting to wear out a little bit, it starts making a funny noise when it's going through the fabric. It sounds different. It's like, it's hmm, coming down into the either fabric. I have a dirty machine or I need to change the needle. And I, 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 uh, been test running micro tips, man, they make tiny holes, which is beautiful. But do you know how many I've broke already? <laughs> Because you just, if it goes through the, like a thick, where you have multiple um, joints coming together, and it's too, and it's thick, it, you oh actually goodness. break one going down in the middle of that. So, that like, oh, it's machine. not meant for that. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> no, my machine does not like those. My, my, I have a, I have a baby lock, but it's not a very powerful baby lock. She's pretty old. She's, she's almost 20 years old. I bought her used and she was almost 20 years old. Wow, um, still so running. She's, not, she's not very powerful. She, she works fantastic. I absolutely love her, but she's not very powerful and she does not like those big thick layers. She she really struggles for sure. Okay, number five. <laughs> oh my, she's really put me on the spot here. Um, I would say that don't um don't worry about the quality of your fabric or the quality of your thread now when i say that there are cheap ones out there that are just not going to work as well as the more more much more expensive stuff but that's not to say that it's not going to work at all right um i i don't recommend mixing the two because of the the you'll find that the fabrics have different thickness and they work differently and some of them stretch more than others. So I don't recommend mixing the two. If you're gonna go with inexpensive uh, fabric, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Please don't feel like anyone's judging you because we're not, <laughs> but, but stick with that for the project that you're working on. Don't try and incorporate more expensive or higher quality stuff in with that. It's just, what it does is it actually takes away, it makes your inexpensive fabric look even more, look inexpensive. Yeah. Um, if you stick with one type, then you, no one's going to notice. They're just not going to notice. Uh, same thing with thread. I mean, Aurifil thread is amazing. Don't get me wrong. It's beautiful. It, it's It's wonderful. It's not my favorite. Uh, it, it's just not my favorite. It's a personal preference thing. I, I 
I don't like the price of it. Obviously, it's really expensive. And I don't, I actually don't really like the thinner thread. That's just not my cup of tea. Yes, it does make it much cleaner on my machine because my machine doesn't get all gunky from the, the dust. Um, so it is much better for my machine, but I prefer a different brand of thread. Um, it, it's just who I am. I, I, you know, that's just, just, just what my preference is. So if you're new to the, the industry, don't stress about having to go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. on, on the most expensive quality, the highest quality fabrics and the highest quality threads. Don't worry about that. I have bought the cheap, inexpensive fabrics from Amazon. You know, Amazon gives you those. In fact, that's what this one here is, is it was one of those fat quarter bundles from Amazon where they don't even tell you who the manufacturer is. Mm -hmm. It works just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It, did, it just depends on the project. I yep. probably wouldn't make a lifetime quilt out of this, you know, some, a quilt that I want to last a lifetime, but a pencil case works just fine. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, take that into consideration when you're, when you're doing this, don't stress yourself out about having to spend all this money on really expensive fabrics. They have a use for it. There, they have a time and a, and a place for that. Um, if you're making a family heirloom, you know, if you are making a baby quilt, then you may want to think about using a little bit more higher quality fabric because baby's skin is sensitive and there are certain things that go along with that. Maybe then you might want to think about it. Or if you're making someone a wedding quilt, no, then, you know, something they're going to want to hold on to and maybe give to their kids and their grandkids, then you might want to think about a higher quality. But that doesn't mean you have to use it every time. No, you um, don't. Um, I think this is from my perspective. Um you have a group, you have groups of people who can afford to buy the quilt, uh, um, what's the word? The high-ended quilt fabric, I guess you could call it, because, right. you know, when you pay $12 a yard, that's expensive. But yeah. I also think that when you go to, to Hobby Lobby and uh -huh. Joanne's and Walmart, based on your own budget, it is not a crime to make oh, no. a quilt out of that fabric because that's what you can afford. And I think I, that's something that we, all of us, need to preach about. That if you can afford Walmart or Hobby Lobby, but you can't afford that quarter shop, that's fine. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong Absolutely. with it at all. Yeah. I have a couple of quilts that I have made with Joanne Fabrics fabric. Um, the one thing I will say about the the big box store fabric the joanne fabrics the walmart's target you know whatever the big box stores if you will the one thing i will say about that is there's nothing wrong with buying that fabric especially if you're buying a pre-cut but be very careful with the pre-cuts because i have gotten yeah. um the their cutting techniques is are different than your higher quality fabric techniques so if you're buying pre-cut fat quarters or layer cakes or things like that. If you're buying it off the bolt, don't worry about it. Yeah, I think you should buy a bolt, period, but that's just me. Well, if but if you're buying a pre-cut, just check those measurements because sometimes, unfortunately, they can be off. And, yep. and you want to give yourself a little bit of more wiggle room than normal. So if, you know, if your pattern calls for two layer cakes, you might want to buy three just to mm -hmm. be on the safe side because you will come across a couple of those pieces that are just cut kind of, a little at an angle and you may not want to use those. So I will say that if you're yeah. going to buy the the big box fabric, especially in a pre-cut, the on the bolt, there's no issue, but on a pre-cut, just just be careful. Just be cognizant of that. Yep. That's great advice on that. Okay. Uh let me see. What else do I want to ask you? Do you have anyone else in your immediate family that are quilters? No. No. So just you're the only one. I am the only one, and that's why I started my channel, is so that I can make friends. <laughs> uh, does your girl show any interest in it? Um, Not really. Uh, both of my girls know how to sew. They both enjoy sewing. It's something that they've both taken in classes, and, and actually my one daughter, Tony, has her own sewing machine. Um, but she is more of a garment sewer than she is a okay. quilter. Just, you know, to them, it's an, it's an older yeah <laughs> um, a couple of years ago I lost my dad um to cancer and the one of the projects that I I had just started my quilting journey just started uh, I had 
uh, I hadn't even started the rainbow Bargello quilt, quilt yet. I was still making small things. I was making table runners and I was just trying out different techniques. Um, and I made, but I had some leftover jelly roll strips and I made, I tried to do a jelly roll race with it, but it was only like, it was basically just a, the, a bed runner at that point. It wasn't even big <laughs> enough to really do much with. Um, so it was a bed runner. And so I put that together and when my dad ended up in, um, a nursing home and hospice care at the end of end of his life. Um, I brought that bed runner to to his hospital room to put on the end of his bed because he had a metal bed frame and I thought at least this will give it a little bit of cushion, not a lot, yep. but a little. And it'll be something pretty that he can look at at the end of the at the end of the bed. You know, he can see it there and he can look at it. Um, so I brought that with him and it was and it got lost. Um, unfortunately, we never we never recovered it. We don't have any idea where it went. But after he died. I sat here in front of my machine and, and tried to pick up on my quilting and part of my grieving process, I couldn't do it. Uh, I couldn't sit in front of the machine. Every time I sat in front of the machine, all I thought about was that particular quilt that, that I had just seen quilt, my, dad yeah. and my dad and, and I'd start breaking down into tears and, and <laughs> you can't really sew if you can't see the needle. Oh. <laughs> so um, I kind of gave up on quilting for a couple of years. I just kind of, I put the machine away, I put it in its box and, and I kept wanting to go back to it because it was something that I really truly loved. I just couldn't, I couldn't get enough through my grieving process to be able to sit in front of the machine to allow myself to not, like you said, it's, it's a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. Your, your mind kind of starts to think about all these things i mean not just what you're doing but it starts to think about all these other projects you're working on all these yep. projects you've done before things like that and 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 it just kept going to that one and i just um, eventually um i had a friend of mine who gave me a project to do she was, she was very adamant about a t-shirt project and I'd never done one before but she was very adamant about it she I really need your help I really need your help it would mean a lot to my mom you know my mom's sick this is going to mean a lot to her and I was like okay fine I'll do it I'll 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 force myself to get in front of the machine and that particular project I, I told her I said that project became my therapy yeah um it forced me back in front of the machine it forced me to work through the grieving process that I was going through. Um, and I know this all, all sounds so silly, but it, it, that's kind of just the way it happened. And because of that project, the amount of tears that are in that project, I don't even want to tell you about it, but because of that project, because of that friend and that project, and because of this machine, I feel like I have a whole new lease on. Yeah, you got what, your so dough back too this what this therapy does for me and now since that that whole journey that I went through with it now when I sit here and I sit in front of this machine it has a whole new therapy for yeah. me that I didn't even know I needed yeah um, and that's one of the other reasons I have the YouTube channel is it became a therapy for me um I mean we all suffered during COVID for various different reasons every one of us you, you can't tell me that there's anyone in the world that COVID did not affect somehow in some way. If they said uh, it didn't, they're lying. <laughs> exactly. exactly. For me, uh, I, like most everybody else, I went through a state of depression. I was still grieving over my dad's death. I was grieving over my grandmother's passing. I had lost a friend at the same time. It was There was just a lot going on all in that same time frame. And then everybody's kind of stuck inside. And, and so this... I wouldn't allow myself to shut this therapy away like I did the first time. I, I forced myself to work through it and, and it did. It became it became my sem my semblance of peace. You know, this room became my uh, you know my my Japanese garden, if you will. Yeah, I call I call my um my room where I have we divide or I divide it, not him. We cut our living room in half, and half of it's what I call my Zen room. Zen and room, yeah, that's cool, the word I yeah. look for. Yeah. And it's so three it. sides of it are flat plants, and one side is a shelf with books on them. Because I'm a uh, both of us actually are a uh, bookworm, and uh, yeah, so you can sit in there and pull a book off the shelf, even if it's a cookbook, because there's those in there too. 
and sit there in the chair and enjoy the plant while looking at a book, you know, and you're just chilling. Yep. And that's kind of what the, this became for me. I mean, you know, the, the YouTube channel helped keep me moving forward. It kind of forced me a little bit in some ways to stay focused, to stay in front of this machine, to stay sitting right here. And, and I have a lot of videos and a lot of live streams where I've talked to my community about and thanked them because it was, it was because of them and, and the fact that they were watching me yeah. every week and participating with me every week that I worked through my own depression and my own mental illnesses and things like that. And, and I, and I am so much better for it. <laughs> so much better for it. I'm not saying that this is going to work for anybody else. I only know that it worked for me. Um, everybody has to find their own Zen, if you will, but this is what it was for me. And, and now I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm not afraid of what it's going to bring out or what emotions are going to come to me as I'm in front of here. I'm not afraid of them anymore. Yeah, I understand that. That's that's terrific. Tell them that hobbies are important. I've tried to um, encourage hobbies with my kids since they were little bitty. <laughs> Speaking of hobbies, do you have any other hobbies besides the sewing? Cooking. I cooking. love okay. cooking. Uh, cooking is one of my is, is another one of my therapies. Um, and I'm not talking about your everyday rush to get home from work. Yeah, I know cooking. what you're saying. It's you're going to go in there and make yourself a masterpiece, even <laughs> exactly. if it tastes bad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The the it's taken every pot and pan and utensil in the kitchen. <laughs> I understand that because I do that. <laughs> and, <I> do. <laughs> and you end up with this beautiful little plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so cooking is your other go-to all right yes cooking is definitely one of my go-tos i am i have a black thumb i'm not a gardener um i i joke that that uh, my house is the plant hospice it is where plants come to live out their final days uh i am terrible i'm a black thumb i, yeah, I can't I'm plants alive to save my life my mom is amazing she has a green thumb she she does fantastic her yard is just absolutely gorgeous she does an amazing job i did not inherit that trait. <laughs> do you know what the number one killer of all indoor plants are hmm. think about it what would kill plants inside watering yes that's the number one killer of all indoor plants you can underwater them and they'll make it but when you once you pass that uh, point of no return they're going to die uh, what happens is is um i can't do it indoor outdoor it doesn't matter yeah. well <laughs> what what happens is is you have lower light which means you need to, to water lower mm -hmm. and when you saturate a root ball it can't breathe because it uses oxygen to breathe right now people will say well why do they why can you grow them in water because the roots are oxygenating the water and water breathes. Soil, right. when it's soggy, it can't breathe. So right. literally you're suffocating your plant to death. Huh. That's, That's probably what, what it I boils do. down to, yeah. Probably. The higher light, the more you can water. The lower light, the less you water. And I want, I pay really close attention to that here because this is not Florida. Right. <laughs> so in the summer months we get 22 hours of sunlight and in the winter we get 22 hours of darkness mm -hmm. so all of those plants have to switch into i'm going to sleep mode you know yeah. <laughs> is there anything else you would like to share about yourself that you haven't told us about that you think would be interesting to share i'm not that interesting of a person <laughs> oh come on there's going to be something you can tell us about <laughs> Oh gosh, I no, not really. Um, I well, mean, you I, told me you told me if I remember right that you don't have just one set of girls. I do not. No, I do. I have my um, my my husband and I. My my current husband is my second husband. Um, I have twin girls, like I mentioned before. I have my twin girls, and then my husband has a set of twin girls as well. And then he also has, he actually has three daughters total. So he has a set of twins and then a third one. And he and I have been together. We were literally just talking about this the other day. We've been together for 15 years. Um, my daughters turned 21 in March. So they've known him since they were six. Mm -hmm. um, and his daughter, his oldest daughters have known me since they were eight. And his youngest has known me since she was four. Uh, so we've been together a long time. So his daughters have, 
I mean, I, I consider them a part of my family. They are, they are much as much a part of my family as they are a part of his. And so uh, when people ask us how many kids we have, we just, we have five daughters. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. But we have had two sets of twins. Um, I have a set of identical twins and his twins are fraternal twins. For those of you who don't know, identical means they look alike. Yep. Obviously. And fraternal twins means they don't look alike. Yep. Um, so mine, I have blonde hair, blue eyed, identical twins, and he has a redhead and a brunette. <laughs> what was it like raising five girls under the same roof uh well the good news is that uh we have really great we had we had really good relationships with our exes so it was an every other weekend kind of thing so we didn't have them all in the house together all the time we live in a very itty bitty teeny tiny little house uh this room is was actually one of the bedrooms for his three daughters they shared this room oh. with, with us uh, we had one of those double bunk beds yeah. you know uh, we all got to just know each other really well. We only have one bathroom in our house. That's six girls, one bathroom. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and all of the girls, I told you their ages, they're all two years apart. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so there were times. I bet there, I bet there was lots of squabbling at times over who there was were, in the bathroom. There were times where things got a little hectic. And it's funny because <laughs> the last year that all the girls were kind of together before they started going off to school and getting jobs and things like that. The last year they were all together um, just before COVID. Um, we had a pipe break underneath the house. We, we live on oh, a slab. We, no. a, we had a pipe break underneath the house and it overflowed our toilet. And we couldn't use the toilet or the shower for like three weeks until we could get the pipe fixed. And I had five girls, six girls, including myself oh and my him and, and my, my husband in the house. And I'm like, I can't have seven people in this house with no toilet. That's right. <laughs> so I had to call my mom. Oh because my, my mom lives three quarters of a mile from me. I had to call my mom at like 11 o'clock at night and say, guess what? The girls are coming to stay with you. <laughs> So, she, so it was sleepover at grandma's house for the weekend because That's we didn't have funny. a functioning of plumbing <laughs> for a couple of days. Wow. So it's, uh, I think we learned a lot about each other and about um, just about being in small spaces. That's why hobbies were so important to me when yeah. they were younger. Sundays was hobby day here. We did breakfast, we did family breakfast on Sunday morning, and then we did hobbies, and everybody had their own hobby. No matter what it was, I didn't care what it was. Uh, they just had to have a hobby. I had two of them that did sewing. I had two two of the five that did sewing. I had one that did painting. I had another one that made cards, like cardstock cards. Yep. And then the fifth one, she kind of floated between all of those different hobbies, and, and she, I don't think she ever really found the one that really spoke to her so she just kind of dabbled in all of them so it was a lot of fun but Sundays mm -hmm. were hobby day at the house everybody would was in their own space doing their own thing and kind of getting the, into their own zen um so reading was another really big one for us we had we had a set time on every Saturday that they had to be reading we were very strict about their electronics um yeah it was it was a lot of fun and a lot of stress <laughs> <laughs> and I love all of our we love all of our girls immensely and we're so very very proud of them there we have two that graduated college this year we have one that went on to graduate school uh, we have two more that are juniors in college and then we also have a freshman in college so that's uh, that sounds more kids in the house. congratulations well, dogs <laughs> <laughs> then they'll be off to get married and give you grids hopefully not too soon yeah, uh, you know we do our live streams on Sunday morning most of our live streams are on Sunday mornings and occasionally I've been doing Saturday live streams and um, we have just a ton of fun on um, them we do gambling we have gambling on my channel gambling. <laughs> so one of the things that my community is just ex ex you know thrilled about is we have gambling on, on my in my chat on my channel um it's part of a points program that it runs through the the program that I use to run my live streams there's you know things that are built into the program I use and one of them is it's a points program and basically all the um participants of your live stream anyone that's watching your live stream or participating in the chat or they can earn points and you can set this all up and so I call them thimbles I've renamed it as thimbles because that's just a little bit more appropriate and more fun than just points 
Yeah. Uh, so, but there's games then that they can actually play that we've set up in chat that they can play games. It's a slot machines game. And then there's this other one that's like a luck of the draw heist game. Oh, and they can play those cool. games and they can win thimbles and then they can trade those thimbles in. They can redeem them for prizes. So um, at the end of every month, I mail out all the prizes that people have redeemed for the month. Um, I give out uh, random notions. I give out random fat quarters. I have... Um, they can, if they earn enough thimbles, they can become a special guest on the show on one of the channel, on one of the live streams for a day if they wanted to be, or the grand prize um, it, it's just an astronomical amount of thimbles. They can pick our next project that we work on. Um, I would work with them. Oh, and sounds like lots of engagement going on. That's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And that's why, you know, they say, you know, they're, they're a lot of my community members, they pop in, they go, I'm ready for my Sunday morning gambling. <laughs> so, they come on. <laughs> so, I mean, and it's all free. Nobody's exchanging any money. There's no exchangement of hands if you play the games because, you know, you can lose just as much as you can win. Yep. Um, and if you do lose all of your thimbles, my moderator gives them back to you. It's it's not about the winning or losing. It's just about having fun and interacting. So, you'll see uh, the, they'll, start, they'll start talking smack with each other about the slot game. <laughs> it's, oh, no. it's a lot of fun we have a great time with it um you know it's just one of those other things that you're not just sewing you're not just talking about things but you're you're having a little bit of fun in there too so i try to incorporate that uh, the fun aspect of things into whatever we're doing obviously we're making projects for certain um, sure. but there's, there's always a little bit of fun in there too and you never know what topics are going to come up for conversation on my channel we have run the gambit when it comes to conversations i mean we've We've talked about uh, meat markets. We've talked about, uh, but we, we try and stay out of politics. We don't talk about politics or religion. I try and keep that out of the conversation, but yeah. we've talked about, um, you know, the difference in prices of different meats. And um, we've talked about um, vacation destinations. <laughs> we've talked about teachers unions. And I mean, it's just, That's it just cool. runs the gamut of the different conversations we have. You just never know what's going to come up in conversation. Yeah. And you also never know who's going to pop in um, for a visit here either. I've, I'm, I've constantly got people knocking on this door because this is the bedroom door here. Constantly got friends and family that are stopping in, knocking on the door, saying hello. As a matter of fact, my husband, I, I refer to him as Mr. Wizard. He uh, he popped into the channel earlier this morning because he needed to give me something. So um, you just never know. You never know what's going to happen when I turn that camera on and, and who's behind it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I appreciate you doing the interview with me. And I am looking forward to talking to you some more after we stop. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to uh, meet and uh, hopefully interact with some of your community members. I can't wait to get to, to meet new friends and, and um, get to talk to them as well. Well, I think it's going to be great because we're all a big community that can share together all the things that we like to share with each other and I think absolutely uh, the only complaint I have about our YouTube communities I love I love the YouTube community the only complaint that I've ever had is the fact that you know as a creator we can we can um, communicate with our our communities we can provide you know pictures and videos and things but our community can't communicate with us yeah um, the, the, which that's one of the drawbacks to the YouTube community so what I did at least and I'm sure that and a lot of other content creators have done it as well as I created a Facebook group for my for my community it's called danny and the experts because again i'm not one but everybody else is um so we that and that i adore that part of my community as a whole because that is where i get to communicate with them with my community directly and get to see what they're doing yeah. um, so we're constantly encouraging them to to post pictures show me what you're working on because i love i mean you guys get to see what i'm doing all the time i want yep. to see what you're doing because <laughs> you guys <laughs> are the ones that are keeping me uh motivated I, the amount of talent that is in the the members of my community is just incredible and um i just i absolutely love working with them i love talking to them I love interacting with them and that that aspect of the community really makes it easier for me to do that so so I'm going to give them a, a little plug <laughs> for my community as well uh so if you if you're on Facebook you can join Danny and the experts if you're on Instagram you can do uh so not an expert YT for YouTube um on Instagram and then obviously there's the so not an expert um on my YouTube page as well okay thank you for giving us all that great information Thank you, everybody, for watching, and have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.